Hey everyone, it's Arshant, Arshant McBride. Today we're going to be talking about how to do legal research. So uh, lawyers aren't born with this inherent ability to do legal research. You may think that lawyers magically are granted it, you know, maybe there's some secret handshake or a magic wand and suddenly a lawyer can do legal research. That's not the case. Uh, it is really a learned skill. It is something that's built up over time. It's just a little different than other research. A lot of the research principles that you may be familiar with from other walks of life, other endeavors in life, they're all going to be applicable, right? How do you vet your sources? How do you build your information? But your building blocks, the things you work with, are really going to be different. So today, I wanted to do a brief discussion, an intro on how to do legal research to empower you to research issues. Uh, I've been working with uh, a a lot of people over the years, I've trained lawyers on how to do research. I've worked with paralegals on how to develop their skills and how to become better lawyers. And then I've also, over the years now, worked with some people outside law, just interested citizens who are doing research. And I want to bring together all of that concepts to you to empower you to do the legal research you need to do. I'd love to hear that you're out there. Drop a comment, send a like, let me know what you're trying to research. Uh, that will help me with this video and future videos to know uh, the types of issues that people are interested in researching. And so let's start with the framework. I always like to ground things in frameworks because I think it helps us understand. And some of you may or may not have seen me present before on research. Uh, last night, uh, we did a video with Florida Freedom Keepers. It's available on McBride Attorney's Law Show. It's about Florida's forced vaccine laws. And we talked some about the structuring of the legal system. So I want to go a little bit into how does the U.S. legal system work, which is going to be critical uh, to your research efforts. And I want to refer you back to that other video uh, to really get into the framework of how does the U.S. constitutional system work. Louis Leo did that presentation, had some great slides, and really talked about it. We're going to do a high level of it. If it's repeating for you, um, is going to be it's going to be educational. It'll help you ground your understanding. If it's new to you, we'll give you the high level here, and then you can refer to the other video to get the understanding. So the U.S. has a dual system. We have really two or multiple layers of government, at least two. Uh, we have the federal government and the state government, and they interact with each other in a certain way. The legal theory is that the citizens gave the power to the states, and then the states created the federal government. So we always want to keep in mind the legal framework we're in. So we have two major purveyors of law, which are the federal government and the state government. And then the state government often subdivides that authority into counties, municipalities, uh, cities, other locations. So we have different layers of authority. Usually, usually, uh, the federal is going to be supreme. If the federal law does something, it's going to be the top law of the land. State law is going to be a layer lower. And then county laws and municipal laws, city laws are all going to be a subset of the state law. So generally, state law is going to trump the local laws and federal law is going to trump the state law, generally. But we have to do an analysis of where do things come from. If they're constitutional in nature, if we have constitutional arguments and analysis, sometimes the state constitution may give you more rights and more protections than the federal constitution. So keep in mind that as you're doing your analysis, you really do need to analyze most issues at both a federal and a state level, particularly if it's a fundamental right, something that's in the Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution. So a lot of rights were granted in those first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Uh, and so if it's grounded in there, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, right to bear arms, due process, these are all embedded in those first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution called the Bill of Rights. Those rights are there under the federal level. The state can't take those away if you have those under the U.S. Constitution. And then the state may even have more protective versions of those in its state constitution. So you got to think about where you are positionally and how it works. The two do overlap. 
And then layer on top of this, your county and local laws and administrative law concepts. So that's a whole nother piece of this is basically these agencies of the government get a lot of power and they can basically, through administrative orders, create quasi laws, which have force as long as they're within the authority of the agency. It's a little bit of a complex topic. If it's something you're interested in, comment. If I have enough people comment, I'll do a separate video on that. Uh, but understand the framework that you're going to, anytime you're analyzing a law, you got to look at it federally, you got to look at it state letter, level, and you're going to look at constitutional protections, and then you're going to look at the body of the law itself. So you can't put laws in place that violate the Constitution. If it's a constitutional right, that constitutional right will trump. But it starts getting very complex where constitutional rights conflict with each other. Then you have to pick which of those controls. And the Supreme Court has been very, very active in saying which um, constitutional rights control of each other's over each other. So we'll have cases with religion, you know, versus the versus your freedom to, you know, there was one case uh, where a group out in Arizona wanted to get rights to unemployment benefits, but they also were trying to use drugs as part of their religious ceremonies. And the Supreme Court said, look, you can't use the, the religious exercise clause in order to use drugs and then also pick up your state benefits. So they had to merge those two together. And we'll see a lot of that activity. First Amendment, you have the right to free, you know, free expression, but you can typically have what they call time, place, and manner restrictions, which means you can be restricted in how you do it. So you get the right to free speech, but this, you can't just walk in the middle of the street, right? You can have traffic laws and the state can say, hey, you know, take your march around this busy intersection. You can't just stand in the middle of the street to have a march. That's what we call time, place, and manner restrictions. Those are often reviewed by the court about whether they're reasonable in the terms. But it's important to know that constitutional rights do indeed have their limits. So let's say you have a particular issue. And um, yes, case law comes when the law is unclear. When the Constitution, and I'm looking at a viewer comment. Thank you, Ali, for uh, writing in. If you're uncertain uh, about a law, if a law is not clear on its face and you don't understand how it's going to interplay, that's when a case arises. People go to court. And the and ultimately, the court's main job is to clear up ambiguities. The court system, we typically have three with branches in the U.S. system. You have the legislature, which creates the laws. You have the executive branch, which is to carry out the laws. And then you have the judiciary branch, which is to interpret the laws. And they're saying what the limits are, the laws are, and what they mean. When they're unclear, that's when we have cases, particularly constitutional cases. So we're going to start by knowing what we're looking for, right? So Allie here, who's one of our live viewers here at the McBride Attorney's Law Show, has asked about face masks while concealed carry. Okay, well, that is a very uh, timely issue right now at our time of recording, and it, it gives it points to us. It's an issue I haven't researched, so I don't have the answer off the top of my head. <coughs> but let's let's learn and help Allie along here. So. Um, she knows what she's looking for, right? She's looking at face masks and the concealed carry weapons. So we're looking at concealed carry law, and we're also looking at these face mask requirements. So we've got two bodies of law conflicting. These are often when we get constitutional cases and when we have two conflicting bodies of law. What Ali will want to do here is dive into both bodies of law and understand them. So we're looking to understand how these two laws play together. For the concealed carry law, that is a well-established law here in Florida that is enabled through, uh, legis through legislation. We have our federal right to bear ours under the Second Amendment, and then we have specific laws in Florida regarding concealed carry. That's where you're going to want to start searching. So you're going to start looking in the Florida statutes for concealed carry laws, and you're going to want to read those eventually. Now, it may be difficult to find things within the statute. That is very common when you're embarking in legal research. It's often hard to find where these laws are buried in the Florida statutes or your state statutes or the federal statutes. What you'll often want to do in those cases is then look at third-party references 
to get a toehold, to get an understanding of where to start to dig into your research. Where might you get a toehold for, say, concealed carry law? Well, look at the gov government agency that issues the gun licenses. Their website will reference the law. You can actually call their office and say, what law authorizes concealed carry? They may actually have copies of the law linked on their website. So if you can find the government agency in charge of the laws that you're concerned with, that gives you the toehold to get that statutory reference, to understand what law numbers in the Florida statutes or federal statutes or your state statutes apply, and you can start using that to peel back the layers. You may find in a news article or event about who regulates gun carry law in Florida. So I would start there if I'm going to research my rights to carry a gun and whether it's impacted by wearing a mask, I'm going to start there. Um, a shortcut answer, of course, might be to just call the state agency, look them up on the phone and just pick them up and see if they'll give you an answer over the phone. Sometimes you'll find somebody helpful. Sometimes they'll tell you they can't help you. So that's a possible strategy. Uh, you also want to look at case law. This is where going to court decisions can be very helpful in advancing your research. What generally happens in a legal case is two law firms or two lawyers, assuming they're involved, or individuals, will take opposite positions. And in the development of the case, they'll usually tell the court about why their position is right. So you'll have a bunch of writing and documents from one side of the case saying that my position is right. You'll have a bunch of documents and writing from the other side saying their position is right. And then the court often picks one uh, as a basis of which one to which one wins. Regardless of which one wins, those lawyers that develop these cases usually cite the law, they talk about the reasoning, they have an analysis, they go to relevant cases. If you can find some cases talking about, and we're focusing today on you know concealed carry, if you can find some legal cases about concealed carry, you will start seeing the references to the law, you'll start seeing references to the government agencies involved, you'll start seeing references in history about what happened in the law. You'll only find out generally what's relevant to that particular case you found, so you'll have to usually expand the work from there. But usually the lawyers that have argued cases and the courts that have ruled on the cases give you a lot of clues about what's happening. And if, you, if you're seeing here a trend as we're talking about this, Legal research is usually a mosaic, right? You're, you're looking at different pieces, and eventually you're going to see the whole picture. So you're looking at some cases over here. You're looking, you're looking to use that to find statutes. You'll then take those statutes to look for more cases, and you're building your knowledge. And eventually what you'll do is when you have your particular issue and you find the statute, you find the cases that have interpreted the statute, and you see how the courts have reasoned, you'll start to bring that all together into a cohesive picture of what a court will likely do. Uh, so as you're grabbing hold, what are the steps of really building a good uh, legal research foundation, knowing that you've got the right answer? So we talked about getting toeholds. That is really the ultimate start, and it's a random walk, right? There's a lot of different places you're going to look. You're going to look at government agencies. You're going to look at news articles. You're going to look at cases. You're going to look at everything you can grab, and you're going to try to turn that into statutory references and case references because that's where the answers are. The statute should be the controlling authority generally in the U.S. The law written on the books of the state or the federal government should be controlling, but then the cases are going to say if that thing went out of bounds or if it's unclear, the cases are going to help you clarify. So you really need both, and the cases will often read and understand the law for you and speed up the process because uh, you know reading a law dry top to bottom can be very challenging. Another good thing to do if you're trying to understand a law top to bottom is read summaries. There are lots of what are called treatises, law review articles, or journal articles out there which talk about the laws. And what a lot of lawyers will do, myself included, when we want to get familiar about a topic that we have don't have clarity on, that we are, don't understand fully, or we haven't done enough research in yet, is you look for a law review article or a journal article that discusses the law. 
they usually are going to be discussing some aspect of the law, may not be the aspect of the law you're looking for. But if you're looking at, and our example today has been gun control law, if you're looking for gun control law and you can find law review articles talking about gun control law, they'll start pointing out the key issues for you, the key statutes, and the key cases. And that will start giving you the framework so that you can really do your analysis and then you can read and tone in on the parts that really matter to you. So don't be afraid if you're a little astray from where you're headed when you start your research, because as you get deeper in your research, it will bring you closer and closer to the answer. So this is an iterative process. It takes time. You read over here, you get generally familiar, you start understanding how things fit together, and then you dive deeper in a particular area. So I think where a lot of people get frustrated in legal research is they look for something that just has their answer directly. There may not be a direct answer to your question that you Google and find right away. You may not find that statute right away. You may have to look at some law review articles, look at some legal treatises, look at some guidance about what the law is, and then use that to direct you closer and closer to your answer. Um, when you're reading the law, let's talk a bit about reading a statute. Uh, they can be very dense, so you want to break them apart. They're usually broken in sections. The ends and the ors are very important in reading a statute. Uh, you'll often see a list of things. You know, you can do this if this, 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 this. And then usually it's connected with either an or or an and. So the or means usually you need one of those things. An and means you need all of those things. So if you start looking at these lists, you need to figure out whether there are ands or ors in the statute. Um, you also want to look at carve-outs and exceptions. So often statutes have a rule of general applicability. You can do this or you can't do that. And then usually there's exceptions, except as provided by, and it'll refer to another statute, or except in other cases. So you really want to pay attention to those exceptions and carve out as you go there. Um, but it is good getting you pointed in the right direction. And then you can go back and look at cases and confirm your understanding. Lawyers have access to commercial databases of cases, uh, which really gives an advantage. But if you're a member of the general public, you, you have Google, which will help you a lot. There's also Google Scholar, scholar.google.com. Uh, you can then go there and hit more of a legal type database with Google. So that will help you a lot to bridge that gap of access to information between you and, say, an attorney. So um, you're going to be going through a volume of information, whether you're an attorney or a lay citizen. And once you think you understand the law, that's when you go back to your cases one more time. So as you've done your research, you've read general articles, you've taken that into the statute, you've gone into cases, now you're starting to develop a theory. You can then go in and confirm that by researching cases and make sure that the law that you think it is hasn't been ruled on in an opposite way, what we call overturned as a lawyer, you know, flipped over by a court. Uh, the court basically changed their mind on that. So you're going to look for the overturn of the law. So yes, um, somebody's asking about Scholar, Google Scholar. Yes, it should be scholar.google.com. And I'm going to confirm that right now. Yes, scholar.google.com. It gets you much more into a legal medical journal type research database than what your standard Google is. It will really step your game up a little bit uh, more and get you into more uh, refined answers. So check the cases, uh, look at other people that have advanced the theories and see that. Go back to the administrative agencies. We talk some about administrative agencies, right? There, Most laws here in the U.S., because our legal system is so complex, have federal and state agencies that administer those laws. So go there to those administrative agencies. They will often do a lot of work interpreting the laws and telling you what those laws are. For instance, the IRS has tremendous numbers of publications. When you hit a tax law issue, you can go get an IRS publication. 
and they're usually pretty accurate. They do get sometimes tested in court. Sometimes the IRS takes the wrong position in their publication, and a later court case will overturn them. But most of the time, the agencies are usually pretty accurate in their interpretation of the laws that govern them. So if you can go out and find an agency that deals in the item you're dealing with and get into their administrative rules and regulations and guidance, they'll often get you a long way there. When I do securities law work with my clients when they're offering stock, I usually go to the U.S. SEC uh, because the U.S. SEC does a very good job of laying out what they expect. And then I can do my research from there uh, and get answers from them. So, um, and somebody, you know, Ali's commenting, it's difficult to navigate because you get so much information. And yes, that is absolutely the case. And that is one of the real um, skills that you develop over time. As you do more of this, you get better at sifting through the information. That's one of the reasons why you want to start with law review articles. You want to start with um, administrative agencies. You want somebody who's done the work of reading all the laws for you. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of people out there now that have done the work of digging into the laws. Why do you want to start from scratch? Read the work of somebody that's dug into the law. Use that to get the framework and the overview of what you need and then from there, you can launch into your deeper research. That will really get you, it, it'll save you a lot of time. It'll save you a lot of frustration if you can go from the step of being curious about a law or wanting to research a law to seeing what an administrative agency or what a law review journal, what a lawyer or law professor has said about it, and then use that information in turn to then deepen your analysis. Let somebody else do the work to pave the path for you. You want to follow up on their work. You want to check their work, of course. You want to verify their work, and then you want to dive off into any subtopics they didn't cover. But let somebody else pave the path for you, and that's generally going to be articles, newspapers, um, legal journals, uh, law review articles. These people have done a lot of work reading these laws, putting these laws together. Let them help you. And so that is out there for you. Um, really appreciate your questions and interactions. I know some of you are watching it live. Some of you are going to watch it on recording. Drop me a comment. Let me know you've been here. Let me know what questions you're researching, what I can cover in future videos. McBride Attorney's Law Show is all about helping people understand the law and empower themselves. Uh, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Ring the bell for notifications. But more importantly, let me know what I can do to help you uh, with your understanding of the law, particularly from a business context or from accomplishing the things you want to accomplish. So let me know, folks. Arshon signing off. Thank you for being here and joining me. And I look forward to talking to you again very soon.